of you. Uh, so in the audience, it looks like we've got uh, a great number of, of people joining us today, including current scholars who are currently in, in school. We have alumni joining us as well. And I'm really pleased to have all the participation and support from our economic club members, as well as um, uh, our emerging leaders who are part of the economic club sponsorship program. So before I turn it over to Marissa Mahoney, um, I just wanted to also just acknowledge the work of the economic clubs education committee, uh, who is hard at work, they meet quarterly to review all the facets and programming that are run through the Economic Club to support each of our scholars um, and the program that helps get um, facilitate uh, the trajectory of going through college. And of course, we wouldn't be here at all without David Rubenstein and his continued support of our scholarship program. So I um, I, would, I would be remiss if I did not mention that I think each of us, um, but especially the scholars, would benefit from re reviewing the Economic Club website to see some of the presentations that we offer at the Economic Club and, and maybe per, uh, perusing our website and looking at some of our recent speakers, including the Secretary of Commerce, who was interviewed by, by David Rubenstein. Gina, Secretary Gina Raimondo spoke just um, at the end of September and it was very timely. Um, she gave uh, about 20 minutes of remarks and I saw a lot of economic club members taking notes. And so whenever I see that, I think, wow, this is, this is really remarkable and memorable. So if you're interested in seeing um, a member of the president's administration and how they present remarks. Um, this one was particularly special because this was her first public speaking engagement in her role as Secretary of Commerce. So if you're interested in seeing how someone might present, um, it, it would be worth taking a look at that. And like I said, she spoke at the front end for about 15 minutes. So um, also recently, David Rubenstein uh, presented to a smaller group just uh, last week to our Economic Club of Emerging Leaders. And I wanted to just close by saying one of the things he mentioned what had to do with public speaking, ironically, and he said, he said, you can't lead without followers. And so his recommendation is no matter how small the audience, whenever you have the chance to speak and you are invited to do so, to take that opportunity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marissa to kick off today's program. Thank you, Mary, and thank you everyone for being here this evening. We're really excited for the conversation. Um, effective public speaking is something that we all um, can always use tips on and continue to perfect. Um, public speaking can be anything from um, any meeting you take or a conversation that you have with someone that you want to influence them to having a huge room of people waiting to hear what you have to say. Whatever it is, it's an important skill to learn. And um, even though uh, we aren't able to uh, cover what would be covered in a, you know, a course on public speaking, as Dr. Flagel um, is is uh, great at doing, um, we hope that this tips shared today will be really helpful to all of us. Um, I'm going to take a second to introduce um, our moderator, who will then introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, our moderator is an Economic Club alum of the program. His name is Miguel Portillo, and he is a 2015 scholar. He currently serves as a risk and financial advisory consultant at Deloitte, um, and he graduated um, here in DC from the Capital City Public Charter School, and then went to attend Sewanee the University of the South, where he received a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Um, he is very much employing that uh, degree by providing cyber and strategic risk services to clients in the government and public services industries. Um, he has great expertise in different um, areas of security and privacy, risk management and project management. Really excited to have him here this evening and he's a leader in his community through the Posse Foundation alumni programs and he's also served on our alumni leadership council here at the Economic Club. So thank you Miguel for being here and I'll, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Marissa. Um, yeah, so I'd like to start off with, uh, first and foremost, thanking the panelists, um, Andrew Flagel, um, President and CEO um, of the Court System of Universities of Washington Metropolitan Area. Um, he graduated from George Washington University with a bachelor's and a master's degree, um, as well um, 
He has a PhD in higher adult and lifelong education from Michigan State University. Um, he is a visiting senior scholar uh, at, the, at the George Washington University. Um, he has board memberships at Connected uh, uh, DMB, DC College Access Program, as well as the Greater Washington Board of Trade. Um, previous roles has, have included Dean of Enrollment, um, George Mason University, Senior Vice President at Brian Dis University, Vice President for Advancement and the Association of American Colleges and Universities. So welcome, Andrew, and thank you for being a panel for today, uh, today's discussion. Thank you, Miguel. And also welcoming uh, Conrad Woody. Um, he's also a partner and head of the U.S. Association and Corporate Affairs Practice at Augers uh, Bernstein, um, graduate of Howard University in political science. He advises clients on corporate affairs, communications, public affairs, public policy, government affairs, and trade association, CEO and leadership roles. Um, he leads the firm's corporate board diversity initiative and co-leads the firm's US Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council. Uh, board memberships include the Polygate, uh, Step Africa, starting with Today's Inc., Young, Young Veterans Board of the Arena Stage. Uh, previous roles include Principal of um, Corn Ferry, Campus Diversity Recruiter, Goldman Sachs, um, aid of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes, North End. So also a very pleasure uh, welcoming you here today for our discussion as well. Glad to be with you. Awesome. So there will be a couple questions. Um, we'll, you know, I'll open up discussion, um, and I'll invite the panelists to uh, feel free to rotate and, and share insights on our questions for for today. Uh, I think the first question I'd like to start off with is defining public speaking and, and your own style in particular. Mm -hmm. So how. Uh, you would define your own style of public speaking. Andrew, would you like to start us off? Uh, I was just about to invite you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I love the pleasantries between us and we don't even know each other, but, <laughs> but good to be with you, Miguel. Good to be with you, Andrew. Good to be with the scholars and the staff of the Economic uh, Club of Washington, D.C. Uh, to answer your question, Miguel, Public speaking is an opportunity to communicate ideas to an audience. And the benefit of it is an ability to not only communicate ideas, but have people understand who you are and what you know. That's exactly right. And, and glad to be with you all as well. And thanks to the Economic Club for inviting us. I, I As uh, Marissa mentioned briefly, I've had the opportunity to teach public speaking at several universities. And, it, and it's amazing to me the degree to which students come into class nervous, unsure, uh, and not sure why they might even take public speaking. But it, every study we've done of employers comes back that communication skills, particularly speaking and written skills, are the things they look for most in employable skills. It, it's rated high by Pew, by Strata, by every study that's out there. So it's critical to your success and career. But I actually, you know, I love that you asked about style because one of the things that I, I, I believe students get obsessed with is picking a speaker that they think is a great speaker for one reason or another. We can get into what makes a great speaker. I have some ideas on that. But I think that what, hand, what I see most often, one of the challenges that students make is they pick a speaker with a style that's really different than theirs. I tend to be very high energy. I love talking off the cuff. I tend to weave in lots of story. I gesture a little bit, by the way, different when you're on camera than when you're in person, we can talk about that too. But the other students are, are quieter. They have a different style. And, and I think it's really important to find your style and play to your own strengths. Your genuineness in your public speaking will come through. And when you try to adopt a style, it's like wearing a suit that doesn't fit. It, it will be noticeable how uncomfortable you are to the audience. 
So whatever your style is, you want to build on that. And one of the places to start to explore that is where are you most comfortable in conversation? When you're speaking to your friends, when you're speaking in a class, what's the style that you're most comfortable with? There's some do's and don'ts that we can add in. I, I'd like to eliminate the word like from everyone's speaking patterns to the degree I can. Like, we should stop using the word like every other word. But in general, that speaking style that you're most comfortable with, your conversational style is the style that becomes better for you in public speaking as well. It's an amplification of the style with which you're most comfortable that will be, to extend the metaphor, the, the suit that might fit you best. How has your ability to master public speaking uh, improved or helped your uh, advance your career? Well, I'll, 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 we'll flip orders, how's that? So I, <laughs> So I started my career uh, representing George Washington University around the country uh, as a speaker. I had the opportunity to then go to Capitol Hill because one of the leaders there saw me speaking and brought me in because I was talking about access to higher education, transforming opportunity. So it, at almost every turn in my career, it's been my public speaking that led to the next opportunity. And often uh, one of my absolutely wonderful mentors who hired me at one of my positions. I was in the position for about six months and he said, boy, you really know data. And I said, you say it with such surprise. And he said, well, we hired you because you could speak really well, but we didn't realize you could do all these other things. So uh, it really has been the, the, the leading edge for me in opportunities developing in my career. Great, right, Andrew. I think for me, it was all the way back to university. Um, being at Howard University and Marissa and I had the privilege of attending together. Uh, many of you may know it is a very political and activist culture. And I had the benefit of being the president of the College of Arts and Sciences Student Council and, and the president of the Howard University Student Association. Both very public roles for a national private institution and running for those offices required a significant amount of persuasive communication skills, confidence and understanding how to public speak to be able to show you earn the votes of a student body that is very critical about who their leaders are on campus. And I'll say as someone who grew up as a very shy guy, not a lot of confidence, I found my voice through music. I was able to play the piano, bass guitar, organ and drums um, to be able to develop the type of confidence to be able to public speak has manifested a wonderful in a number of parts of my career from Capitol Hill, as Andrew said, to being on the speaking circuit as a diversity recruiter at Goldman Sachs, speaking at Morehouse and Spelman and Harvard and UCLA and really capturing the audiences on why they should come to Goldman Sachs. And even currently as a headhunter for the last 14 years, it's really important from a one-to-one -one perspective, but also in a large format when you're talking to a board of 12 CEOs who are, invi who are inviting you to pitch on why you should advise them to do a project. And so, you know, starting early as someone who's an introvert, and I want to say that out loud because it's really important. So the perks that just are outgoing and, you know, like to be the center of attention are not always just the people that like to do public speaking. There's a lot of power in people that have introverted personalities to be successful, to be successful in this regard as well. I like how you both uh, pointed out, you know, introvert, you know, students and, and sometimes students are shy. Um, so for for the scholars out here, for, for college students who, you know, may need that extra boost and, and confidence, uh, what advice do you have for those college students who want to become more comfortable in, in public speaking? I guess I'll start. It's okay to make mistakes. That's number one. You have to start somewhere, but I encourage the scholars and the people on the call today to just start, right? And as you do it more, as you build your confidence, as you make mistakes and you build your cadence of speaking style, specifically to what Andrew said about the type of conversational style, you'll get better and better over time. But 
number one, it's okay to make mistakes and just find the courage to start. Uh, boy, uh, I couldn't have said it better. And, and I love the idea. You know, I'm, I'm a recovering musician as well, mostly oh. percussion. I, I played the saxophone behind me briefly, but people asked me to stop. <laughs> but, you know, we have an expression in music performance that if you're going to make a mistake, play it loud. Yes. Uh, if you if you fumble, most of the time, the audience doesn't know when you fumble part of your speech. They don't know when you missed. They know if you stop and go, oh, no, I screwed up my speech, which people do periodically. Uh, much better to just keep rolling. And I'll, I'll add to what Conrad said that not only the more times you speak, but the more you rehearse and rehearse in front of a mirror, rehearse with your phone videoing you and watch it later. It's awkward to hear your voice recorded, by the way, it will sound bizarre to you. That's OK. But you get used to seeing how you stand and how you speak. By the way, I want you to listen, because Conrad just gave an example of this brilliantly. One of the things that we do in our society generally is what's called vocalized pauses. You, we have a habit, and the word like is a perfect example. When we're speaking, when we're thinking of the next thing, we do ums and ahs and hums. But when, when Conrad said cadence, if you listen to the pace of his speaking, when he was thinking about the next word, he paused. Which, by the way, in, in all the studies that have been done, if you're not sure about the next thing to say, and you pause, it actually seems more dramatic and like you know, whereas if you hmm and uh, so as you practice, listen for those vocal ticks, for those extra noises that you're making for no reason, and try to practice those out. The more you use pauses to your advantage, the more you rehearse, the more comfortable you're going to become. I, I, confident is a big leap because I still get nervous in front of a big audience. I still, I speak like kind of, I speak in front of college students and high school students are merciless, yes. merciless. <laughs> Sometimes I have to speak to middle school students, misery. So I, I still get a little sweaty, get a little nervous. But if you're comfortable with your speaking style, even when you have that, that nervousness, you'll be able to work through it because you trust that you do have the pace. And I love that, that term, the cadence to pull you through that, that next line. So I like how we hit on some of the elements, you know, that make uh, an effective, uh, a speech effective, right? Um, can you tell us more about um, what other elements um, make a presentation and its goal of informing or influencing or inspiring an audience? What are elements that are key in your opinion? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to talk about three areas that you want to consider when you're approaching an audience. How do you make your speech memorable? How do you make it believable? And how do you make it persuasive? And we often run those ideas together, but, but they're distinct in a lot of ways. There are some tricks to each of them. So I'll just touch on a couple and then I'll turn it over to Conrad for real expertise. So... <laughs> When we think about making a speech memorable, I always try to give three elements that are, are the, the basic structures of a speech. Grab attention at the top, close with some strong emotional pitch that resonates, and in between, organize your speech logically. So if, and by the way, it makes it way easier to memorize a speech, way easier to follow along for the audience if you have a logical organization. So opening, closing, and logical organization help you make a speech memorable. It's harder to make a, a speaker believable, especially today. We, we are skeptical of, of so much in our world for so many good and at times really challenging reasons. One of the issues that you wanna work on is credibility. How do I establish credibility on a subject with an audience? Do I tell them that I teach the subject or I've researched the subject or I've practiced the subject or do I just tell the audience that I'm really interested in it, but, but give them something that allows them to believe that you have some knowledge of that on which you are speaking, even if it's only because class assigned me this topic, I've spent the past two weeks studying it just to let them know you have some insight. And then trustworthiness. And, and I think that's probably the hardest. How do you resonate with your audience? How do you tell them that you have some affinity with where they are? Is it 
with what you wear? Is it with your tone? Is it with saying to them that, that you share a set of ideals or beliefs? But how do you work an audience into trusting you? And this is probably the, the great white whale of public speaking is establishing trust with your audience. And you need both of those elements to be persuasive. And then there's a whole set of theories around persuasion that has to do with knowing your audience to an even greater extent. And, and this gets into, boy, it's gonna sound scary like I'm doing Facebook algorithms, but how do you come close enough to what your audience thinks that they're willing to come along for the ride to you to a different thought? In other words, if you go to an audience that loves strawberry ice cream, they, they, there's no other ice cream in the world for them than strawberry ice cream. And you start off your speech with, I'm gonna tell you about chocolate ice cream today, but the first thing you need to know is you should hate strawberry ice cream. You've already lost them. So if you start off telling an audience that they're dumb, and, and boy, think about this in terms of how we've tried to message vaccines, how we've tried to message COVID testing, how we've tried to message politics today. If you start off telling an audience that they're just wrong and stupid for thinking it, your ability to persuade is, is lost at the start. All right, so memorable, believable, persuasive. Great thing about these programs is like, I even learned things on this. So thank you for that, Andrew. The only thing that I will add is just a couple of things. I wanna just reinforce what Andrew said about preparation. It is key. And it's, it's not only key just with respect to content, but it's also very key as it relates to how you present yourself. So, you know, making sure that you review the content, you know, set it up as Andrew uh, advised um, and prepare. Number two is something that I say, sharing your energy. Now this can be any kind of person, outgoing, introvert, shy, whatever, but just do your best to share a little bit of yourself, similar to what I'm doing with you, Miguel, right? Being able to <laughs> capture the audience by sharing your energy with them and bringing them into you. And lastly, from a content perspective, it's making it real for the person across the table, whether you're speaking to two people or whether you're speaking to a thousand people. And I think it's a little bit different way that Andrew shared about persuasion, but being able to structure your ideas and content to make it applicable to the lives of the listeners, which helps them bring you along in the journey. And so those are the couple of things that I would keep in mind that are elements that are helpful uh, to be effective in public speaking. Well, and I, if you, I, I love that because I, I want to build on two elements. One is that that journey is speaking is telling a story yes. weaving elements together it engages people more than a recitation of facts but i love what you said about giving energy and i have to tell you it is hard to give yes. energy on zoom because you don't get energy yes on, and you're sitting oh i hate giving speeches sitting i hate this i want to be up and bouncing around like a lunatic this energy is sucked out of you and one of the things, boy, I get on my kid about this. I'm sure he loves it is, is posture. Just standing up, boy, when you walk, I, I tell my students all the time, your speech starts when you walk in the room, when the Zoom light goes on, when they see you, they know you're the speaker a lot of the time. And when they see you, they already start to pick up where your energy is. And if you're, you know, looking all ragged and staring at your, You've already sent a message as to how you feel about the subject, how you feel about being in the room. So, so you're, and it doesn't mean that you've got to be, you know, the Energizer Bunny up there cheering, but your enthusiasm for the subject does come through your your excitement to be there in the room. So you at least, it's not about total confidence or overwhelming power. It is about feeling excited about being there. So you got to work yourself up to that. I think that was a great point, Conrad. Awesome. Before I open the, you know, the, the floor for the audience, you know, participants are free to ask questions in a minute here uh, from the audience. Um, I have two final questions and they're sort of related to each other. So the, the first one is, um, you know, what are, who are speakers or, or are there any speakers or speeches that um, you have been in particular, you know, impacted by um, and then are there any books that you recommend um, in particular? 
That's a great question, uh, Miguel. Uh, I've heard so many speakers. I think uh, one that comes to mind, and he is of the lower tone variety, is a gentleman who's an investor named Ray Dalio, uh, who was the former founder of Bridgewater and Associates uh, before he became an author and an influencer. Another speaker that I really enjoy listening to, and David Rubenstein has recently interviewed him for his podcast, is Reed Hoffman. Uh, who was a partner at Greylock, founder of LinkedIn, early investor in Facebook and eBay. And the reason why I bring up Reed Hoffman is you can tell that he has this very interesting style, which Andrew specified earlier in our dialogue. He see he is this billionaire investor that's done so many cool things, but every time you hear him speak, whether it's on his podcast or as a guest on others, he feels relatable. He feels approachable. The way he speaks with his cadence and the way he talks about his stories makes sure that the listener will walk away with something that they can use, right? And the last person I would bring up is, uh, uh, and you may or may not know him, but feel free to Google him, uh, is a gentleman in clergy named Pastor Howard John Wesley. And the reason why I bring that up, because everyone in this audience comes from different cultures, backgrounds, religion, and so on and so forth. But the reason I bring him up, Miguel, is in an area that is very subjective, right? Everyone comes at religion differently. But he's able to communicate to a wide variety of audiences, whether it doesn't matter your race, station, class, anything, to ensure that he speaks to the hearts and minds and he inputs a lesson every time he speaks to you. So, you know, I don't know any books. I would I would give it to Andrew to help us out for that. But um, those are just three people that come to mind that all have different styles, but are able to effectively communicate uh, and with their audiences at scale. Yeah, I was trying to rack my mind for recent books that I, that I really liked on public speaking. But it's funny because one of my public speakers breaks all of my rules all of the time, which is President Obama, who is the master of the vocalized pause. Mm -hmm. Right, he ums and ahs his way into every speech and somehow he makes it endearing. So this is like the great music maestros who tell you once we've taught you all the rules and you get to a certain level, you can break. I mean, Yo-Yo Ma can break every rule on the cello and sound magnificent. Watching President Obama speak is like a master class in working around the rules to feel relatable and feel connected. It's really astounding the way he's able to do it. Um, I, I like you. I've seen so many different speakers over the years that I've I've tried to use as examples for my classes of different styles. And I have to say, one of my favorites is the current president of Howard University. Uh, Wayne Frederick is just warm and relatable. He is a I mean, he was a child prodigy, world class scientist, surgeon, and yet you would think he's you know the guy you just met on the corner. <laughs> Uh, he just feels so warm and 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 engaging to me every time I see him interviewed and speak. So uh, he would he would be it is uh, he is my former board chair and hired me. So I'll admit to a little bias. <laughs> picking him. Thank you, thank you so much. And I noticed on the chat here, uh, John Miakam, John Miakam was uh, was brought up, and just just a fun fact, John Miakam was is an alumni from Swanee as well. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'll um, now I'll open the floor up to our uh, our attendees here on the on, on the call today. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask any questions you have. Um, yeah, I think feel free to any any given time here. Feel free. This is your floor. Well, while we're waiting for some folks to to ask the since we didn't get the first question, we'll take the second question. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of advice to think about for students when you're working on nervousness also is that you do not have to memorize your speeches. And the, the idea that we've beaten into people that somehow you're better if you've memorized every line, do rehearse it enough that you're comfortable with it. But you can have notes with you and sometimes you can even have it written out. Most of those presidents that you saw give those beautiful speeches had a teleprompter the whole time. Sometimes they ignored the teleprompter the whole time. But 
finding that pace that you're comfortable with, you, you may find it much easier if you have the words near you. So figuring out what the speaking setup is going to be so you can figure out where those notes are going to sit so it doesn't look like you're looking at notes the whole time is one of the keys. You want to have them somewhere discreet so that for the most part, you can glance at them, but spend most of the time working eye contact with your audience. And then I'll, I'll just share uh, my pet peeve for Zoom or in-person or however you're doing it. I believe PowerPoint is the worst thing that was invented for it, building speaking opportunities. The more you get away from PowerPoint, I think the better off you'll be and the more memorable your speeches will be. Save PowerPoint for when you've got data that you've got to show people, but leave the PowerPoint behind whenever you can. And they'll tell you that they want your PowerPoint when you go to a conference and tell them, I'm just going to speak to people and tell them it's because Flagel told you that was okay. I see Lori Lee. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Lee Stennett, freshman finance major from Ho at Howard University. And my question is, what advice would you give about public speaking when delivering in a virtual setting to ensure you connect with your audience effectively? Well, Lori, uh, fellow Howard alum here. Um, I think it goes back to our earlier part of the conversation is you know, preparation, sharing your energy, I know it's very difficult to do that in a virtual medium, but whatever it means to you, sharing your personality, your enthusiasm for the topic, um, your belief in the content that you're presenting. And then lastly, finding a way to bring what you're sharing the audience with you. So make it real for the person across the table. Um, so being able to tweak it and say, you know, Public speaking is really good because, as you know, Miguel, you know, Deloitte has one of the best management consulting firms in the world, recently did a study about communications in a virtual environment, and that's really critical. And I just made that up off the top of my head, but you see how I will pull somebody in to make what I'm saying real for the person across the table. And so hopefully that example helped, but Andrew, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Well, actually, I think Conrad was giving a great example there. So what you see on the screen has a lot to do with your interaction with people live. So, you know, you have a lot of people who are right up here or it's, you know, way down on them. So you want a little distance from the screen. And then what they'll teach you, whether you do media training or training for Zoom, is as a society, we tend to gesture low. If you think about when you're standing up and you gesture, you tend to gesture out kind of from your waist. Well, uh, as I discovered early on in media training, if you're gesturing a lot from your waist on camera, you look like you're just bopping around because no one can see your hands moving. So when you're gesturing for a, a television or film or Zoom audience, you're actually going to gesture a little higher than you're used to. And it takes a little practice to do. So I think... Finding a setting in which you're going to be comfortable. I mean, there's obvious you get these with every Zoom script, right? Please find some place with a good connection and quiet where the dog's not barking and the kids aren't screaming. We do the best we can. I actually like when the cats walk across the screen right in the middle of presentations. But having that awareness that they can't see you when you move off in a certain direction or you stand... I will say I, a couple of my colleagues increasing, increasingly use standing desks and a setup for Zoom so that they are standing when they're doing sessions and presentations. And I much prefer that. I, I really have looked at what I may need to rearrange here in order to be standing when I have opportunities like this to speak with all of you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Oh, it's not a question. It's just an experience about public speaking because I was I, I was an intern with Verizon um, this past summer. We were asked to work on a project, like coming up with with solutions, post pandemic solutions on how to better off the society in terms of business skills, 
so my team and I chose business, um, time management and how to work on PowerPoint presentations, which will be presented every every Friday before the um, final presentation with the Verizon board members. And I try my best not to read off the slide, but I still find myself reading off the slide. Then I later on come to realize that it's because I put the words in there instead of just putting like data to show them and explaining to them what the data means. So after, <laughs> after listening to all your talks of public speaking, it has really helped me a lot when it comes to presentations, virtual presentations and public speaking. Oh, thank you. That's a terrific point, Ho. And I, I'll add, well, because when you're Zooming, when the PowerPoint is on, that's mostly what people are seeing. And so whatever's on the screen is going to be more memorable at that point than what you're saying to them. So I, I you know, with uh, all respect to the McKinsey's and Deloitte's and Accenture's of the world that like to have the entire sessions on PowerPoint, I really encourage students to, if you have a message that's got to be on screen, a slide, show the slide and then turn it off, go back to speaker view, go back to that opportunity to interact with people. Uh, that'll be a great way to strengthen, especially in a Zoom environment, your interaction with uh, your audience. Takia. Hi, I'm Takia Ball. I'm a 2015 economic scholar. And one question I have is for someone such as myself who talks with their hands while they're presenting or walk pace from side to side, during the presentation. Can you give me any tips about that? Sure. So one of the things that I try to help students with, I, I actually, as you can see, I like to gesture when I talk. Gesturing is okay. And walking around is okay. You want to be careful not to meander and get into a point where it looks like you're kind of aimlessly flapping. When it becomes distracting to the audience is when it becomes a problem. So as you rehearse, start to think about, are my gestures helping make my point? Am I walking in a way that helps convey my organizational structure? So I often encourage students to think about movement at times when you're changing subjects in your speech. Think about gesturing when you wanna make a stronger point. Even slow yourself down and watch it on camera to see, do my gestures make sense to me? as I'm watching the speech. You'll get more comfortable with it as you become more conscious of it, but gestures aren't a bad thing. We gesture in our society. It, it, it is far odder to not move at all, which is a habit many students have when they start out. Uh, don't restrict your mood. Even a hand in your pocket now and then casual, comfortable. I wanna go back to what Conrad said and being relatable. If, if it feels like it's your conversation style, it will work for you if you're trying to completely change your style. That will probably make you seem less authentic and will be much harder for you. And the only one thing that I would add to Kia is do your gestures make the audience feel included? It's something that Andrew said, you just have to practice in your preparation and then measure the more that you do it. But you want to ensure that when you are gesturing, when you are walking around, that is making your audience feel included and not that they have to follow you around everywhere or follow you around the screen. Um, it's just something to keep in the back of your brain as an effective tool to ensure you're bringing your audience to you. Now, a lot of the public speaking books will say open hands are better, it's more inviting, open are exactly what Conrad's saying, you're bringing your audience into your discussion. And then you watch Bill Clinton <laughs> constantly poking that thumb at you, and yet he's very effective. So again, the, the rules tend to get broken when you figure out a style that you're that, that works for you. It's a great question to give. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we have uh, we have time for at least one more question. Matt. 
Um, yeah, uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I go to Lafayette College and I'm a sophomore uh, studying international affairs and governmental law with a minor in economics. Uh, my question is kind of related to uh, finding your style. Uh, I find it sometimes that I have to adjust to the, 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 the audience that I'm speaking to. And sometimes my style does not really work to kind of like make people aware of what I'm speaking about. And I have to adjust to the system that they're used to or some information or how I kind of like speak have to be adjusted to for them to make like to for them to kind of like understand what I'm saying. So I guess how do you shift to that uh, or adjust to that uh, environment if you have like a different place or a different environment that you're speaking with? That's a great question. You want to start, Andrew, on that? Sure. I, I think one of the largest challenges is knowing your audience and having a feel for their expectations and how you might have to adjust them. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest. We speak a little slower. Miguel went to University of the South, uh, Sewanee. When I go down to Sewanee, I had best to slow my roll. If I speak at the same pace, I would hear. It is annoying and distracting, and I am get accused of a rat-a-tat-tat style. If I go to New York and I speak in the style I would in Memphis, uh, they are uh, you know, ready to tear out their hair waiting for me to get to the next sentence. So there are some, some regional differences, there's world differences, and, and especially if you are speaking to other cultures in other countries, if you're walking into a, a church where you've never been or a mosque, you wanna make sure you have an, a cultural awareness of the audience that you're addressing so that your tone, your clothing, the way you're presenting yourself is respectful of the audience that you're in. That, that can be more, as I said, you, you wanna keep your own style. You're not trying to be inauthentic. You don't walk in and start doing an accent, but you do want to make sure that you're appropriately respectful of your audience. And, and balancing those is, is really hard. I, it's hardest when you don't really know who your audience is going to be. And so you try to find kind of a middle of the road uh, safe lane, uh, in between speeds, in between cadence, to try to make it as clear as possible and as relatable as possible to your audience. I love that. I think that's a great answer. So thank you, Matt. Miguel, may I read a question from the chat, if you wouldn't mind? Yep, go for it. Right. So the question from the chat is, it's always kind of scary to start out speaking. Once I get going and more into the subject matter, then just the scariness of starting, my nerves go away. Do you have any practical tips for getting past those initial nerves? Andrew, do you want to start and I can come behind you? Well, you know, we talked a little bit about rehearsal being the best weapon. I think even the, the best speakers I work with, the best actors and performers, uh, Kerry Washington's one of our graduates from, from GW that I've known for a long time and, and she still gets nervous going on stage, going in front of people. So it, it's not that it's gonna go away. The more confident you are in what you're gonna present, the easier it is. I also, what you, and I, I don't know who wrote you the, the chat, Conrad, but that, that idea that you gotta get over the hump and into the speech is a really important one. That moment where you start off is important. So I talked about making your speech memorable, that opening becomes important. Do you have an opening that where you're really comfortable telling a story that you know well, making something relatable to your audience? You're, you're often, that's your introduction to the rest of what you're going to do. You're setting the tone. And so having that opportunity to tell them a little something about who you are, which isn't necessarily describing yourself. It's often with a joke or a story or a quote, but what are you leading in? What are you telling the audience about yourself at that moment? And when you're confident in the opening, it becomes a lot easier to open that door, to walk onto that stage uh, and to start off your presentation. That's a great, that's great content, Andrew. One thing that I do if I'm giving a public speech, if I have a little bit of jitters and I just had a TV interview that I just went into it, I have any prep, you know, I just give myself a one 1,000 in my mind. And I don't know why, but just saying one 1,000 in my mind before I start speaking just kind of puts me a little bit at ease, right? And if you are being interviewed by a panel or a moderator like Miguel, 
to collect yourself, it's thank you, it's a great question. Or thank you for asking me that, Miguel. It's similar to the cadence of a 1-1000, which brings back your power to position you to answer with what you know. And so those are just two tactics that I use, whether you're giving a speech or you're in a conversation that helps you get over those initial nervousness at the beginning of a, of a conversation. A, a habit we have when we're asked a question on a panel is to repeat it back as oh, part one. of an answer, which actually can be problematic. You're, you're often feeding a soundbite culture. So if uh, it's one of the tricks that journalists use to get you to say something that they want to, they ask the question in a way that you'll parrot it back the way they've asked it. So Conrad's explanation is perfect. Thank you for that question. Even if you're not gonna answer the question, by the way, as a politician, you always thank them for the question, which gives you a moment to compose your next thoughts. And that gets into an idea that's true for any time you have jitters in your life. The anxiety that comes up, which is this idea that we talk about in mindfulness and taking time. Uh, one of my uh, favorite colleagues who studies student anxiety talks about just taking that deep breath and holding it for five. Before you go on stage, breathe. We forget to breathe. So make sure that you take that moment for yourself to, to the, the, we use the very similar terms in music and in art to center yourself before your performance. Let that tension kind of roll out of you. It won't go away completely, but it'll help you with letting go and, and getting over that hump to get in front of the audience and get started. Awesome. Thank you so much. And now we'll, we'll move on to our uh, breakout room discussion. Uh, so members, alumni, and emerging leaders, you will all engage with, uh, with scholars um, and each, and with each other um, on, the, on any topic related to public speaking. Um, we'll, we'll have small group introductions. I think groups will be split up into five, five to seven people each. Um, and you'll be, you know, feel free to ask additional questions that um, you wanted to ask during this period of time. Um, you know, we have some uh, suggested questions, you know, such as, are there any, um, you know, what is something new that you've learned during the panel discussion or um, any additional um, um, advice or tips um, that the panelists mentioned, feel free to use that time um, to ask any other questions or, or give your comments as well. So I'll, I'll think I'll turn it to Marissa um, for free to split us into our groups. Awesome. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Conrad and Andrew. Such a wonderful panel discussion. I just, I learned so much myself and was really excited to, that our scholars are getting so many nuggets of wisdom. Um, it's always important to remember to breathe. I know I have to remember that sometimes as well. Thank you, Andrew, for that. And of course, Conrad, always great to hear um, about how you started out, which I was lucky to witness at Howard. Um, and so it was just 